Um, what I decided to do is because there wasn't really some really juicy stuff in the Tenth Circuit for the last year, but there are a lot of cases before the U.S. Supreme Court that are or have the potential to have significant impact on governmental entities, particularly municipalities. The, uh, there was a case that we were all kind of excited about that was going to hopefully define the scope of the attorney-client privilege, uh, which had not been defined for a lot of times. And the court took, granted certiorari, they actually then had oral arguments, and then they decided they didn't want to decide it, so they ruled that it was improvidently granted. And that's the In Re Grand Jury case. Um, right now, there are 43 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court that have been fully briefed and orally argued, and no decisions have been issued. During the current term, only 10 cases have been decided today. So obviously, we have a lot of things to do. I've broken it down into the um, amendments of, this, of the Constitution that I thought were most relevant. So the first are the First Amendment cases. This is a Tenth Circuit case. Um, as you might recall, a couple of years ago, we had the great wedding cake controversy, whether you could require a baker to give a wedding, make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. We are back with same-sex coupling issues. This case is actually out of Colorado, and it's out of the Colorado Supreme Court because Colorado has uh, a anti-discrimination policy that is not just Oklahoma, like Oklahoma's, which is uh, against employment, um, housing, and the like. Colorado is prohibits discrimination on the basis of a protected class on any protect on any public any business open to the public. Now, uh, 303 Creative is owned by a woman, and she does um, basically web drawings and whatnot for social events. So she's basically a PR person who does your website, your graphic designs, and all of that. And she decided that weddings would be a lucrative business, so she wanted to add that to her web program. But she also was adamantly opposed to same-sex marriage, and she thought it was only fair to tell everybody that don't call me if you want me to plan your same-sex marriage. And so that's what she put on her website, and Colorado sued her and said, you can't do that, that violates our statute. And so the court took cert, as they did in the wedding cake controversy, but it's kind of interesting how they framed the question. They framed the question as, does the statute compel artists so that kind of freaked me out. Does it compel artists to either speak or stay silent? And if so, does that violate the First Amendment? I assume artists meant that she was a graphic designer, and so her website involved graphic design. So um, I'm sort of like, I, I mean, I've seen wedding cakes that were works of art. But here, it's clearly they framed it in terms of art. So we are now in the realm of, in the internet world, and there are two other internet cases we're going to talk about, in the internet world, is that art, and if it's an art, can a state restrict what an artist can put or, or not put on a web design if it is discriminatory against a protected class, and in this case, same-sex couples. The next case is also out of Colorado. Colorado had a bad year. This is a particularly interesting case for all of you within the police area. Mr. Quarterman was sentenced to four and a half years for threatening ver verbal threats. There was no physical threat. It was verbal threats against a singer he didn't like, Miss Whalen. Miss Whalen was um, a singer. She was trying to create, uh, get her career going. She had concerts, and he would show up at the concerts and put, make rude comments, and then he would send her threatening letters and things of that nature. And so she was very distraught. She stopped um, performing. She had a nervous breakdown, and she uh, filed criminal charges against him, and the court found him guilty and sentenced him to four and a half years in jail. The issue here before the court is what constitutes a true threat so that it can invoke a, sta a criminal statute, a state criminal statute. Does it have to be, and think about it when we talk um, in terms of sexual harassment. 
So with sexual harassment, remember we have this weird test, is it objectively offensive or is it subjectively offensive? The court is faced with the same issue here. When the statement is made, is it an objective threat? Wouldn't a reasonable person, find me a reasonable person, would a reasonable person deem it to be a threat? Or does it have to be just Ms. Whalen is the eggshell plaintiff and that she felt threatened, and so it's a subjective test. Mr. Quarterman obviously wants to get out of jail, and he is arguing that it should, if it was the subjective test, it is too much of a chill on the First Amendment, and that really it should be an, a, more of an objective test. The court has framed the issue of objective versus subjective, and also the, the nature and manner and place of the speech. So you need to look at, in this case, it was all mostly private. He would send her obnoxious emails, threatening letters, um, things of that nature, versus public threats. So that's a case to look at in terms of criminal statutes and the ability to uh, file criminal cases for what is called a direct threat, or the court has actually framed it as a true threat. After this is not in the paper because it only court was uh, cert was only granted Monday. There are two cases of great significance in the you know that you know the wonderful world of Facebook or social media. There's actually two cases. One is from the Ninth Circuit, O'Connor versus Garnier. That is a um, school board case, and the other case is Ledecky versus Freedy. It's a First Circuit case, and it is a, civil, a city manager case. So Mr. Freedy is the city manager of a city. In each of the cases, the individual uh, prepared a social media page. In the school board case, they uh, created the two of them, created the social media page, first initially for um, running for office, to promote their candidacy for office, and they got, both got elected. Very good, except they continue to use that page and they continue to make comments about um, the school, the curriculum, and things of that nature. Not a whole lot of private comments on the page. They had a couple of parents who, well, we've all seen in the paper where school board meetings have gotten a little raucous, and these parents were raucous parents, and so the two school board members banned them from their social media page, blocked access to it. And they, the two parents sued. And in that case, the Ninth Circuit said, it ruled in favor of the parents and said that while the state actors, when, when a state actor enters the virtual world and invoke their government status to create a form to express their own opinions, the First Amendment goes with them. So in that case, they said the First Amendment does in fact apply and you could not block the parents just because they didn't like what you said. In the second case out of the First Circuit, you know, the First Circuit's New England where I'm from and it's always a little weird anyway, but this was the city manager. And the city manager also had his own Facebook account, own social media, where he did about, about half of it was personal. His dog, his wife, his kids, vacation, whatever. But he also had some descriptions about the city's coronavirus response and things of that nature. And a couple of the citizens obviously wanted to respond that they didn't like having to wear masks and they didn't think that they had to not go to the bars and they shouldn't have to go to the restaurant and he blocked them. And in that case, the first circuit said, no, that's okay, it's its own social media account. If it was on the city's account, maybe not but it's his own personal account. And yes, he is expressing his own personal views. And just because he's city's manager, he's not city manager 24 hours a day. I dare say if you took a vote of all the city managers in Oklahoma and asked if they were an eight hour day job, the answer would be overwhelmingly no. It's a, 20, it's a 24, actually 36 hours a day. So that case has just been taken. Right now it has been consolidated. Uh, the docket numbers are 22324 and 22611. As I said, it was just decided, uh, taken, granted this Monday, uh, which is a little odd because it obviously the courts, uh, the briefs had been filed beforehand, so I don't know exactly why they waited. The big case is De Groff versus DeJoy. 
We thought this was going to be a whole lot worse than it looks like it might be. Uh, this is the next case after, for those, it is a First Amendment freedom of religion case. There has not been very many U.S. Supreme Court cases on freedom of religion under the First Amendment and the obligation to accommodate religious needs. The two cases you might remember from law school, actually was so long ago that I actually was still in law school, was Transamerican Airlines versus Hoddison. And that is still the litmus test. The Hoddison ruled, Mr. Hoddison was a mechanic for TWA, but he was a very specialized mechanic. He, he worked on engines, and he, at one of the uh, maintenance facility, he was on only one of four mechanics who could do this. And if he wasn't there or one of the four were not there, the big jets could not take off. And so obviously it was a big deal that you always had a mechanic involved. He was a seven-day Adventist, and their religion does not believe in working on Saturdays. And it's not simply not going to church, but Saturdays should be reserved for uh, church, meditation, family life, and charitable works. In addition, the tenet of the religion also prohibits the person from asking somebody else to work for them because they should also be able to devote the time. TWA was also a union, and I stress that because the uh, DeJoy case is also a union case. And in that particular case, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of TWA because the gentleman ultimately had to resign, and they ruled in favor of TWA because they said the burden of providing the accommodation of every Saturday off was more than de minimis. So up until now, the rule for religious accommodation cases under the First Amendment is the de minimis rule. Can you show that it's something above de minimis? And in that case, they said, well, look, the union, because the union had shift, uh, they had bidding by seniority. This guy had low seniority. The union said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we, we want our seniority list to uh, prevail. And there are a lot of cases from TWA that said, yes, if, senior, if it's a union seniority issue, you can basically violate the person's right because you got to contract here, and this way they did not have to accommodate Mr. Hardison. The only other major Supreme Court case on religious accommodation uh, since the TWO case does not apply that, that type of issue. It was the Abercrombie and Finch case. As you might recall, that is where a woman applied to be a salesperson at Abercrombie and Finch, and she came to the uh, interview wearing her job. So it was clearly she was of the Muslim faith, and they hired her. And then when they hired her and she showed up for work the first day with her hijab on, they said, take it off. You do not project the image of Abercrombie and Finch. And she sued, and not surprisingly, she won. This case is where Mr. Groff worked for the Postal Service. And he was, uh, he believed in Sundays off, so it was not a seven-day Adventist case. Postal Service, as you know, most of the time only delivers mail Monday through Saturday, they don't deliver on Sunday, and they don't deliver on holidays. So there was never a problem with the Postal Service up until 2013 when the Postal Service decided to contract with Amazon to make more money. And so they were going to deliver Amazon packages in Postal Service trucks with Postal Service employees in Postal Service uniforms on Sundays. So originally, this gentleman said, well, well no, I don't want to do that. And he was in a rural post office route. And so at first, the uh, station that he was at didn't have a contract. They weren't required to do the Sunday uh, deliveries. But then they were, and he moved to another department, another area again. Then the union stepped in and said, OK, look, we're going to uh, initially say we're going to have two groups. You can be a volunteer to work Sunday because nobody was normally scheduled to work Sunday. So we're going to take our volunteers first, and then we're going to have the unvolunteers, the people who don't want. And if we can't fill the ranks by the volunteers, we're going to mandate that you take the non-volunteers to work a Sunday, because it's undue burden on everybody on the volunteer list to have to work all the time, although probably some of them like the overtime. And Mr. Um, Groff said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he got disciplined, written up, reprimanded, suspended, and he finally decided to quit in lieu of being terminated, and he obviously filed a lawsuit. The initial feeling was with the um, 
number of conservative judges that are on the court and some early comments that were made, it appeared that it might result in a higher reasonable accommodation standard than is currently the standard under the Americans with Disabilities Act. As you recall, under the AD Americans with Disability Acts, you have to do a reasonable accommodation for a disability unless it constitutes an undue hardship. And so they, there was view that the court could go much further than the undue hardship rule in the ADA, and so people were getting a little concerned about this. All argument was held, and it came out kind of interesting. Three of the justices, uh, uh, Alito, I bet you can guess the other two, but it happened to be Clarence Thomas and Gorsuch, were all for, oh no, the highest standard, religion, you know, it's more than undue hardship, you have to accommodate unless the sky would fall. Okay? Then, rather surprisingly, um, Coney Barrett and, let's see, who else was it? said, no, 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 maybe it is, um, oh, yeah, Kavanaugh and Barrett. That oral argument said, no, wait a minute. W you know, there are other reasons, but, but we're not going to just destroy businesses because somebody wants to pray on Sunday, and it's more than just praying. They want the whole day off. And, of course, Kagan said, whatever. The Solicitor General of the United States. And Mr. DeJoy, as you might recall, is this postmaster general who was uh, appointed by President Trump, got a whole lot of bad press during the elections, but he's, you know, he only gets sued because he's postmaster general. Um, but even the uh, solicitor general said the de minimis rule really is not functional. We will agree it's, it's a goofy rule. We're going to have to do something. And so the question is where it's going to fall. I don't know where it's going to fall, but if reading the transcripts of the oral argument, it looks like it might be someplace in the undue hardship rule, like the ADA, but maybe not even higher. What Kavanaugh and Connie Barrett want, suggested to be done is send it back to the court, to the lower court, and this is the Third Circuit opinion, and have the court say, look at the facts. In, those, in this case, there was real hardship to this rural postal department. They had people quit, they had people transferred, and they had people filing grievances under the collective bargaining agreement that making them fill in for Mr. Groff was a violation of the CBA. And their opinion is, you know, it probably should have been ruled in favor of the Postal Service, but even not on the de minimis rule, but on an undue hardship rule. So I think that is probably where it's going to go. As I said, originally we thought it was going to be just a nightmare, but it looks like it's only going to be a little bit of a nightmare. But clearly what is overwhelming is that the de minimis rule is going to fall. And that's the rule that's been in place since 1976. Tyler versus Hennepin County. Remember the case, bad facts make ook law. Mrs. Tyler's 94 years old and a widow, and she lives in a condominium, and she ran out of money because she lived too long. And so she ran up a $15,000 tax bill to Hennepin County, and she, there was also some other assessment fees. And so the county, cruel, unusual people that they are, they foreclosed on her. And so they then turned around and sold her condominium. They sold it for $45,000, which was $25,000 more than she owed on the debt. And they kept it. And so she, she brought a, a lawsuit saying, well, wait a minute, isn't this a taking of my property without due process? But also another interesting thing is, is this a violation of the Eighth Amendment? Excessive fines and punishment. So, I, you know, if I were a betting person, I would bet that Hennepin County is going to lose. Think about what Thomas LeBlanc just said at the, his very last talk about arresting people on warrants simply because they cannot pay. I think this is a case where, yes, she couldn't pay, and yes, she owed the taxes, and yes, she could foreclose on the property, but you don't get to keep the widow's money. So, again, not a good case on the facts. 
The Attorney General of Alabama had a difficult year also. This is Colley versus Attorney General and Sutton versus the Attorney General of Alabama. One, it's a, um, two cases almost identical. One, if anybody has ever, is Matthew still here? I can, if he's not, I can make fun of him now. Has anybody ever raised boys? You know, when they're about 14 to 19, some place their brain goes away, and then all of a sudden they come back. And we've got two of these teenage boy uh, brain dead cases. Uh, so Mr. Collie's son, God love him, took daddy's car without permission, and he went joyriding with his buddies, and he gets stopped by the police, and guess what they found? Marijuana and paraphernalia. So the kid gets arrested, and what happens? They impound the car. But they kept the car for two years. And so during this two-year period, Mr. Cully didn't have a car to go to work. And so he had to either buy a new car, or he had to rely upon bus service, or the kindness of strangers, or whatever. And so his issue is, well, wait a minute, I'm an innocent person. I did not commit the crime. My brain-dead kid did. And so why should you be able to keep my car for two years, and isn't this a violation of the 14th Amendment? So in the Sutton case, it's, the facts are almost the same, except it was Miss Sutton's now ex-best friend uh, who took her car. And the guy goes off joyriding also, and he gets stopped by the police and gets what they found. They found methamphetamine. And so they arrested the guy, and they threw him in jail. Nobody, and I can guarantee you she did not come down and throw his bail. And they confiscated her car. And they kept that car for 20 months. So we had two cases where we have the innocent owner defense on when they try to come and get their car back. And so the, what the, is before the court, and I think it, it, is, it has the potential for a lot of implication because a lot of departments confiscate vehicles or other things in the commission of a crime, is this is to, reserve, uh, to uh, resolve conflicts among the circuits about civil asset forfeitures. Now, the Tenth Circuit is more in line with probably what the Tenth Circuit is, uh, what the Supreme Court's going to hold, um, but it is worth wa uh, watching because I think they will set clear guidelines on the innocent owner defense and when you have to have a hearing, not two years later, for people to get the property back that is truly an innocent taker. Race discrimination. Um, probably you've all seen this in the papers. These are students for fair admission. They brought two separate lawsuits, one against Harvard University and once against the University of North Carolina. Uh, Harvard obviously is in the First Circuit. And this is to determine whether the court is going to overrule or otherwise modified Grutner versus Bollinger. That was the old California case that was decided in 2003. It appears pretty clear there is going to be changes to that case, the, the Bollinger case. It was interesting because originally those cases were also combined. Uh, so the students for a fair admission, the Harvard and the North Carolina cases were combined. They have now been split by the court. The only reason I could figure out is the Harvard case is brought under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The North Carolina case is brought under the 14th Amendment. So there are different standards when you apply the 1983, uh, I'm sorry, Title VII to a 1983 14th Amendment case. So my assumption is that's why they um, split it. But the fundamental issue is, um, are they going to modify Bollinger? And my assumption is yes. And that may then leach over into other areas. This is a weird case. I'm sorry, it's just weird. And I don't know why they took the court case. I don't know why and, um, the woman is. Uh, Mrs. Lau Lau Laufer. Mrs. Laufer is disabled. There's no question she is disabled. Um, but she is a prodigious litigator in support of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's fine. That's, you know, that's nice. But she sued Atchison Hotels. Now, as we know, under one provision of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Places of public accommodation, which means hotels, doctor's office, lawyer's office, city halls, whatever, must be accessible. 
And so Miss Atchison sued, Miss Allower sued Atchison Hotels because, not because they weren't a co reasonable accommodation, because she never even booked a room. She never even tried to book a room. But she says that they didn't publicize on their website, Modern Media Day, their accommodations for the disabled, and therefore she was a tester. And she was testing uh, whether the hotel was in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and therefore the question before the court is, does the tester have standing to challenge a claim under the American Disabilities Act where they didn't personally suffer any damage, but they are suing on behalf of future people who might be injured? As I said, it's a weird case. But it's the only ADA case, ADEA case on the docket that I've seen so far. Water law issue. I don't, I mean, I don't know in much anything about water law, but I thought this was a weird case too. Uh, the Sacketts bought this very nice piece of property and they wanted to develop it. And they started doing the preliminary, they got a, a permit from the governmental entity and they started to clear the lot, putting in sand and gravel and whatever. And all of a sudden the EPA comes running in and says, stop, you may not build on this property. And the question is, well, why? And they said, well, it violates the Clean Water Act because it could be, it could constitute wetlands. And so the governmental entity, the county in this case, had no authority to grant you a building permit because it is superseded by the Clean Water Act and this is constitute wetlands. Ultimately, the EPA said, you know, I don't really like our position and they withdraw their, they withdrew their objection and the court did not find it moot. They said this was a matter of significant interest and so therefore we're going to proceed. So the question before the court is what is the proper test to determine wet, whether wetlands constitute waters within the United States so that a city and county cannot supersede the Clean Water Act? I had never seen one like this before. And so I bring it to your attention because a lot of you are out there giving building permits all the time and you're approving plats. And so one thing to keep in mind is, is there a possibility that this is in fact wetlands under the Clean Water Act? And hopefully the court is going to give a definition of wetlands. This is a Ninth Circuit case uh, and Ninth Circuit is unique, shall we say. Then we have a couple of miscellaneous cases from the court. They don't really um, apply per se to municipalities, um, but it could be in your municipal court system. Uh, Hanlon versus Brackeen. This is a challenge under the Indian Child Welfare Act. You've probably seen a lot of publicity in Oklahoma about this. Uh, this case is actually though out of the First Circuit because where I grew up there are uh, recognized indigenous tribes. They're nowhere near as aggressive, shall we say, or vocal uh, on their rights as they are here, and most of them are in the New England states. But in this case, it was an issue of um, what portions of the Indian Child Welfare Act will be allowed to stand. And it was brought by individuals, both parents, uh, couples who had a long-term foster child that they wanted to adopt, it was by uh, parents who wanted to adopt a child that was in the foster system but was uh, fell within the Indian uh, Child Welfare Act and what should be the scope and is it discriminatory against individuals who are not tribal members. You might have read in the paper two days ago the Oklahoma Supreme Court had a ruling five to four and it held in that case it did it, it determined that the interest of the child who was in foster care with a parents, with a couple, superseded the rights of the biological mother. And they then terminated the biological mother's rights and allowed the child to go for adoption to the foster parents who did want to adopt the child. Um, there was lots of evidence that the child was doing extremely well with the foster parents, whereas thriving was their his psychological welfare was better. But it is an interesting to look at that five to four decision and 
I always like to see, as I say, sometimes with the U.S. Supreme Court, it looks like every now and then somebody went into the wrong bathroom because you get these wild opinions where all of a sudden, what do you mean you're dissenting? You're supposed to be over with these people. Same thing with this case. There were four people appointed, no, three appointed by uh, Governor Stitt. Uh, there was Jim Winchester, who I've known, used to be a city attorney himself. And it's like, Jim, you're, you know, you're usually over here. And so... It's a five to four decision. It just came out. Glacier versus Northwest. Um, it is the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. God love their souls. Although this is a private sector case, I think it could have input in Oklahoma in um, municipal collective bargaining. In this case, uh, Glacier Northwest was a concrete manufacturer, and it made concrete for the big high-rise apartments. I mean, big, you know, concrete that was really expensive. When the teams just went on strike, somehow a lot of the concrete got damaged. And so the Glacier um, Northwest sued and said, yes, you could go on strike, but you can't destroy my property. So the question here is, and um, under the National Labor Relations Act, it, can a company sued for damages incurred, monetary damages incurred, in the midst of a legitimate strike. Now, although this is under the National Labor Relations Act, the Oklahoma Supreme Court has said that the Oklahoma courts can look to cases under the National Labor Relations Act for interpreting the Fire and Police Arbitration Act. So that's why I put it in there, is that it has the potential to impact going down. I'm not saying any of um, the fire or the police or, uh, or ask me would become ag physically aggressive, but it's a case worth keeping track of. Remember what I said, stupid kids? Okay, CLG versus Siegfried. This is where a brain-dead 16-year-old went with his buddies to a thrift store. And so they went to, as I gather it's like an old Army-Navy store, but they found some World War II paraphernalia in uniforms, and they put it on. And to say that their web page or their, what do you call it, TikTok, YouTube, or whatever it was, I'm old, um, was offensive is belittling the point. It was, ex oh, just horribly offensive. Now the kid leaves and he goes home and I think he must have said once he gets away from his buddies who are egging him on, this was a really bad idea. So within two hours he takes it down. However, as we know, it lives in infamy. And somebody had taken a screenshot of his posting during the two hours that it was on and took it to school the next day and distributed it. And as I said, it would be offensive to 99% of the people in, in the world if they have any decency at all. And so um, the school board originally suspended the kid for five days to do an investigation. They then suspended him for another five days to do more investigation, and then they expelled him for a year. And the father sued. He said, yeah, my kid was a jerk. I'm not, I'm not denying he was a jerk. But you're not his parent, I'm his parent. This did not occur on school property. It did not a school occur during school time. There was nothing that the kids were wearing because, by the way, remember at the thrift store they were putting on inappropriate paraphernalia? So there was nothing to show that they came from the school. And it wasn't. He didn't disseminate it. And so you're not, you can't act as in locus parenti to my kid and suspend him. I get to decide his discipline. So first of all, it's a really good case that discusses speech in schools. So those, and any of you who uh, might do extra work for school districts like I do, it's a really good as analysis of all the most recent cases on school. Spe schools have special standing, as we know, even for drug testing. You can drug test people in school, students that you could never dr uh, do anybody else. So there's a really good case, and there was a recent U.S. Supreme Court case, Mahoney versus Area School District, and Thompson versus Raglan is the most recent 10th Circuit case. But that wasn't really the issue here. The issue was basically qualified immunity. So the school superintendent, the school got sued, and so did the school superintendent, 
who, of course, just made the decision to expel the kid. And so the school superintendents uh, filed, it was a 1983 case, and he filed a claim for qualified immunity. And as Thomas, I think I wasn't there for the whole thing, but as we know, qualified immunity should be brought up as early as possible, and it is an appealable order if there are no facts in dispute, and it's not clear whether the law was clear. So this is a qualified immunity uh, uh, qualified immunity lawsuit under unusual facts, but again, it goes to a common theme that we're seeing on social media issues. Because remember, we had the other two social media cases. Uh, one did involve another brain dead kid, but the court is looking at, and it's kind of frightening because about ten years ago, they issued an opinion where they said. We don't really understand this internet stuff. And so, and that was the case of the police officer who was fired after he used the city's cell phone to communicate with his mistress so his wife wouldn't see it on their personal cell phone. Had been warned repeatedly, you're over your uh, a lot of time, you're over your tech number of texts. And he said, whatever. He continued to do it. They fired him. And then the court said, we don't understand this texting stuff. And so now they're going to be deciding three cases involving social media stuff. But this is an interesting qualified immunity case. In a few minutes I have left, um, there are two interesting 10th Circuit cases this year. Um, Shrum versus Cook. In Shrum versus Cook, um, Mrs. Mrs. Shrum died of an overdose. And hubby calls 911. I mean, wife's dead. And the police show up. And the police proceed to search the house. And they found drugs and drug paraphernalia. And they brought criminal charges against the husband, not for murder. It was for the drugs. Now, ultimately, they dropped the prosecution because they couldn't prove that it was his drugs. I mean, it was the wife who died of the overdose, not him. He then files a malicious prosecution claim. Now, when I was in law school, many decades ago, well, most of you weren't even born yet, um, malicious prosecution, we always learned, is you had to win the criminal case as a predicate to bring in the malicious prosecution. That's how I always understood malicious prosecution, and I am wrong, according to the, well, looks like, according to the Supreme Court. The question is then, the, case, your, the prosecution has to have a favorable termination. Now, usually you would think a favorable termination is an acquittal, and the court said no. In this case, it was because the DA dropped the charges. So the claim, the criminal case, was favorably terminated in, in Mr. Shrum's favor. So that is before the court to see if the 10th Circuit interpretation should be upheld. And so it's a you know, nice, interesting case, but it's one also to think about when, um, if you're in your municipal prosecutions, you know, don't always jump the gun and file the charges. Make sure you have the facts, because if not, if this case holds up in the U.S. Supreme Court, just by dismissing the charge does not get you out of the deal. So if you're going to have something bad and you're going to dismiss the charge, try to get a release. You know, pay a little bit money, get a release. But if not, you could face a malicious prosecution claim because you've dropped the claim and it was now deemed terminated in favor of the individual. Okay, this is from the Western District of Oklahoma, uh, David Russell. And I had it, I couldn't, I couldn't stop myself, I'm sorry. It was Governor Stitt. This is a qualified immunity case where the governor was sued individually and he raised the defense of qualified immunity and he lost. Now, we know that the state of Oklahoma cannot be sued under 1983, right, because of the 10th Amendment, but that does not mean individual state actors cannot be sued. And in this case, Governor Stitt was sued individually along with the state of Oklahoma and several other officials. The facts of the case are that the individual uh, Mr. Rhodes was an employee of the Highway Patrol. And Mr. Stitt, Governor Stitt, decided to fire several people in the Highway Patrol, including the head, I forget what it was title, I think general or something major, and fired several other people down the line. 
But the problem was there's a state statute that says, yes, the governor can uh, uh, terminate any department heads, which he did. But then if you're in the highway patrol ranks, if you are, a, say, a major, in this case, Mr. Rhodes was a major, he was a major and he was terminated by Mr. St governor Stitt. But you see, Governor Stitt did not read the statute because the statute provided that if you are the major, if you are going to be removed as a major, you had a right to seek a lower rank position and you were entitled to a due process hearing. And neither of those occurred in this case and Mr. Rhodes was just summarily fired. And in the uh, David Russell said, what is qualified immunity? Qualified immunity only applies if a person would not reasonably know that their actions violated the law, and one assumes that the governor and other people could read the statute, and the statute on its face was unambiguous and was not followed, and therefore the claim for qualified immunity failed as a matter of law. Um, as I said, that was only decided five weeks ago, so I have no idea what's going to happen since that point, but I just put it in there because uh, qualified immunity, um, Thomas spoke a lot about that in the context of uh, government, uh, police enforcement, qualified immunity is also a key possible defense in employment law, but you have, be careful, you need to make sure that when you raise that defense that in fact the law was not clearly established at the time and there's more and more uh, limited areas where it's not decided. The reason I pick these U.S. Supreme Court cases is to alert you that the law will be changing. We need to be aware that the law is going to be changing because of qualified immunity. One, we want to comply with the law. Obviously, we're attorneys. We want to make sure our client complies, but also to give guidance to um, the people we give guidance to, city council, city managers, whatever, that the law, what the law is, what the law has been changed to be, so that they don't inadvertently violate it and then lose the right to have qualified immunity.